along the line this morning, you've in prayers and in songs, you can see that the the flavor and feel of Memorial Day is rich and thick in what we're doing during this particular service. And you'll know that uh, during our life as a church in our yearly cycle, uh, we have two days where we set them aside. On Memorial Day, we set aside this worship service here this morning to give thanks uh, to God and to to give praise to God for those who have lived among us as part of our congregation uh, and our circle of family and friends and have gone in to uh, add themselves to the company of heaven. And and then later during the year, uh, on the last Sunday of June, this year it happens to be, we'll have a celebration of independence where we lean uh, strongly into those that have given themselves in service, uh, both living and those who have passed uh, to our armed forces. So we hope you'll come back to that service. Uh, This morning, uh, our service of remembrance is printed on a manila colored sheet in your bulletin. I'd ask that you turn to it now. There are three sets of candles before you this morning. Of course, on the altar are the Christ and the gospel candle that were burning brightly. To my right, your left, there are quite a number of memorial candles that you or others have brought in that represent and memorialize uh, those that have lived with us and have passed on now. Uh, Maybe this year, um, but many others, uh, people that you've known from the past and and from your life round. And we commemorate them and recognize them as part of the company uh, of this congregation that has ascended now into heaven. And this morning, this third group of candles will be lit. As I read the additions to the company of heaven one by one, uh, we will both uh, say the name, light a candle, and ring a bell in their honor. If you'd like to read along with me, it's on that insert we, pre- we uh, gave to you. The additions to the company of heaven from last Memorial Day to this at First United Methodist Church. Violet Aldrich. Lloyd Atwater. <coughs> Don Bolton. Mark Charlstrom. Marty Dirks. Lindsay Donald. Eileen Downey. Marvin Elwood Doug Emerson Louise Farr Evelyn Fisher Betty Hansen Clarice Hines, Spencer Keaton Sr., Althea Cazella, Jean McCormick, Zarita Mitchell. Dorothy Nelson. (coughs) Lucille Novotny. Stuart Park. Suzanne Pollard. Craig Robinson, Jim Schmickley, Arlene Swoboda, Ron Wheeler, the 
The memory of the righteous is forever blessed. Praise the Lord for their lives. We also, during our time in this day, receive uh, certain gifts from families, and we want to acknowledge uh, memorial donations received during this year in the name of Marvin Elwood, Doug Emerson, Clarice Hines, Zarita Mitchell, Dorothy Nelson, Suzanne Pollard, James Schmickley, and Ron Wheeler. We also will dedicate those memorials at this time, so I'm going to ask a memorial committee representative and uh, our board of trustees chair to come forward at this time. We present these gifts to be consecrated to the glory of Almighty God and for the service in this church <clears throat> in loving memory. For the Carnegie Renewal, the following. Richard Blackford, Jean Balcom, Marsha Balcom, Mark Carter, Jim Cunningham, John Fowler, Jim Hinman, Rita Keppen, Robert Marsh, Larry Martin, Howard Parks, Mary Patton, Suzanne Pollard, Howard Rooks, Shirley Wallace, Ron Wheeler, and Don Walmont. For classroom improvements, Marge Ferris. And for choir music, Marge Ferris. We accept these gifts as a sacred trust and will guard and use them reverently in the memory of these beloved friends and members of our church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we consecrate these memorial gifts to the glory of God and in memory of those who have named here today. The memory of the righteous is forever blessed. Let us pray. Most loving God, without you, no words or works of ours have any meaning. Accept the gifts of our hands as symbols of our devotion. Grant us your blessing as we have consecrated these gifts to your glory, that they may be an enduring witness before all your people, and that our lives may be consecrated in your service through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you uh, for that moment. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, verses 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Let's pray for our pastor as he comes to share this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of this Holy Scripture to us today. And we ask that as Pastor Mike comes to share its meaning with us, that our hearts would be filled with truth, and that our minds would be focused on your words. Bless him and fill him with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, had a friend at college, and uh, he, I, I want to tell you right before I tell this story, he's matured a lot, and he's a lot smarter now. So Charlie lived in St. Charles, Missouri, and he was coming back from the weekend, and a few of us were coming back at the same time. And when you live in Missouri and go to college in Iowa Wesleyan in Mount Pleasant, you almost have to stop at that uh, place where you buy fireworks on the right, right on the way back into Iowa so you can throw fireworks under your friends' doors and stuff in the dorms. I don't approve of that. I'm just telling you what happened. <laughs> Nothing's better first thing in the morning when you hear that... <laughs> And there's 40 bottle rockets shooting into your door underneath. Anyway, that's, that's a duck and hide kind of day right there. Well, Charlie got back and he says, hey, guys, I want to try something. I'm like, what, what are you going to do, Charlie? He says, I brought some M80s back. I'm like, oh, okay. He says, 
I don't know if you know anything about fireworks, but M80 is sizable. It's a big firework. It's, it's, I don't know, a third of a stick of dynamite or something anyway. Um, Charlie, being from St. Louis, or from St. Charles, should have known better, but what he decided to do was he just wanted to see what would happen if he put it in the back seat of his dad's Ford Fairline on top of his steel Coleman cooler and lit it. And we, we tried to stop him. Not very hard, but we tried. We said, Charlie, not a good idea. But, but he lit it, slammed the door and went back about 20 feet. And that thing went off. Boom! Blew both windows out the back of that car. Covered it with smoke and smell. And of course destroyed the Coleman cooler that was sitting in there. And I thought, man, you're dumb, Charlie. But I, we said to him, he's like, he's like, I couldn't believe that happened. He's like, what did you expect to happen? He says, I got to tell you, I didn't expect anything to happen. I didn't expect anything to happen. I remember that story this week as I, as I came across this text. Because I want to talk to you about our faith. Not surprising where you're at. But I'll tell you that many Christians that I know, or many people that affiliate with the Christian church, pick up this explosive thing that we call faith in Jesus Christ. And hold it in their hands and don't expect anything to happen. They don't expect anything explosive in their life to happen. They don't expect any changes to happen. And this is faith in the Jesus who we heard just last week takes a couple of fish and a few loaves and feeds 5,000 people and there's 12 baskets of leftovers at the end of the meal. This is the Jesus who comes across the guy that's, that's laying beside a, a pool that stirs up, that's been paralyzed 38 years, and he simply says to him, pick up your mat and walk, he heals him to full life. This is the Jesus who doesn't even go to visit a little boy who died, but simply says the word, and he comes back to life. This is the Jesus who we meet in Cana at Galilee, changing 150 gallons of water into wine. And that's just in the first six chapters of John. But so many people pick up the faith in that Jesus that does all those things, and as we get to the last chapter of this book, it's going to be recorded about Jesus. I suppose if all the things he did were written down, the entire world would not hold enough room for the deeds of Jesus. But when we pick up that Jesus, so many people that affiliate with Christianity, and they hear the stories and say, oh, those are nice stories, and those happened way back then and way over there. They're nice but we have low expectations of that Jesus working in our lives. Let me tell you this. Faith is a mindset that expects God to act. That's the kind of faith that we have to have. Faith is a mindset that expects God to act. We memorialize <clears throat> a little bit more than two dozen people here today, every single one of them specifically important to me. And I will tell you that I knew some of these people very, very well. And those that we memorialized today had some expectations of God's acting. I remember sitting with one of the folks from this family over here who said in her hospital room to me, God has been so good to me. God has been so good to me. She was in the process of dying of cancer at what I would call a young age. But she was affirming that throughout her life, God had acted in her life. One of the fellows that, that came to the 745 service all the time, he, he'd fought cancer back and forth and this illness and that illness, blood disorders and, and such like that. And I remember him coming back from the south a couple of years ago and we were standing there uh, out in the hallway and he said, you know, the whole time I was going through all these visits to Mayo Clinic and got that, he says, I literally felt God carrying me. I literally felt God carrying me. I didn't think about it. It wasn't some idea uh, about some story I'd heard. He said, I literally felt God carrying me. Now that is an affirmation of God's action. I remember another one of our 830 members for a long time. His name was read a few moments ago too. And every week he'd meet me back there at the back door and shake his hand, my hand on the way out. And he'd always say, it's all in God's hands now. 
It's all in God's hands. Now, not because he didn't think he could do anything, not because he didn't think he was part of his own battle, but he had this expectation of God. He expected God to act in his life and in the lives of those that he knew. And I remember one who, who often stood up here and sang, who said to me in his living room, I trust God will lead me where he wants me to go. Now, those are pretty good expectations of affirmation. Those are, those are expectations that God is going to act. And those are just a few because there were more than two dozen names that we read before, many of which had expectations of God working in their life, and many had affirmations of how God had worked in, in their lives. They were prepared for God's help. They said in such a way in, in, in which they led their lives that if Jesus can walk on water there and then, He's able to help me here and now. You get that? If Jesus was able to walk on water over there and then, He can help me here in my life right now. He can work in the life we live. See, we must transfer the faith that some of those did before us. We must transfer the faith that believes in the miracles of the Bible into our own life situations. The disciples, when we pick up the story, you remember what Pastor Keith talked about last week. When we pick up the story, what we've got is disciples who are just leaving a feast. Started out with a couple pieces of, of, of fish and a couple of loaves of bread. And they picked up 12 baskets. They had seen the sufficiency of Jesus. They had seen the reach of Jesus, how much he could do, how much he could give. They had seen what he had in mind for them. And they're laboring then. They get out on the, the lake. I could explain to you Galilee and all this kind of stuff. I'll just tell you what. Galilee's, the lake of Galilee is in a crevice. It's a big old lake, but it's in a crevice. And so the winds blow all the time, and I can tell you about how these storms come up all the time, which is important to the story at this level, is that the men that are rowing the boats were not unfamiliar with the area. They were not unfamiliar with the lake. And as they pushed, and they'd rowed three or four miles, which was the majority of the journey that they were going on, they were starting to feel that they were up against a pretty good storm. And then all of a sudden they get afraid. But understand this as you read the scripture. This is a critical part, because I've heard this preached incorrectly a number of times. They are afraid, but they are not afraid of the storm. They've been in storms many times. They were making headway, but all of a sudden they are afraid in the midst of their lives. And their fear was not of the storm. It was not of the wind and the waves. Their fear is of a figure. Because in the distance they see someone walking towards them. And people don't walk on water. And they're afraid of that. And Jesus says, it is I. Don't be afraid. And I'm sure in the disciples' minds, they said, well, here he is doing the impossible. Again, I mean, they just had had supper with the 5,000. I mean, it was just like a few hours later. And they're afraid that, that this Jesus that had been so many things to them was even more than they'd understood. Because their fear had to do with the fact that he was so other than them. So holy and apart from them. And so they got afraid. But then as soon as they came to themselves, as soon as they recognized it is I, it's Jesus, they knew that fear wasn't the answer. Invitation was the answer to their fear. Invitation was the solution. And so they invite him into the boat. And if you read the story, immediately it was where they were going. He got in the boat and immediately where he was going. Now, don't think that he was running along the dock. They were that close that he just jumped in at the end. That's not what happened. He, he, he was on the water. And when he got in the boat, immediately their journey, their work, their struggle, their toils were over. Now, I tell you that story because it's our text for the day. Because I want to get to this. I want to get this because this is where I le- think the text is leading us today. See... There's an off-stated but underbelieved Christian truth. Because we so have um, made this into a slogan, We're so, we, have, we have made it pithy. This, this idea that we can trust in God no matter what. I've heard thousands of people say that. And I want to tell you, the reason we say it is because it's true. But don't let it become a catchphrase. It was never meant... To be a catchphrase. 
See, the fact of the matter is that Christ is committed to us. He is ours. And we are His. No matter what. No matter what storms are coming in your life. No matter what difficulties you're up against. No matter what storms you've put yourself in or created yourself. No matter what. Christ is here for us. He will bring us through our storms. He won't leave them in us. And I tell you that because I believe that's where in this particular moment in time, the lesson of this scripture is leading us to. So let's take a look at it. Three things I want to say about it. First, if you follow Jesus, there's going to be storms in your life. Get this. I was listening to a YouTube sermon this week. I listen to sermons all the time. I I tell you that I, I listen to them too to grow my spiritual life, but I also uh, listen to, you know, get better at my craft. But I was listening to this sermon. Yeah, I'm working on the elliptical thing over at the Midwest Athletic Club. And this guy on this, on this YouTube sermon says this. If you have faith in Jesus, he's going to steer you away from your storms. If you have faith in Jesus, he's going to steer you away from storms. I cannot tell you how my old Marian Indian anger came out at that moment. I could not say what I was thinking, so instead I said, that's incorrect. That, that is wrong theology. This, this, <clears throat> this idea that if you have faith in, in Jesus, he's going to steer you away from the storms, that, that is wrong. And I'll tell you why. It's pretty simple, because I think we, we, we Westlands, we believe that, life play, that faith plays out in front of us. Some of the most faithful people I've ever known, the people that believe Jesus was God and that he was come to save them specifically, have died of cancer. Some of the most faithful people I know in Christianity have struggled with relationships with their children or gotten divorced. Some of the most faithful people I know have dealt with depression or sadness. Or mental health issues. Some of the most faithful people I know have aged. Some of, some of the most faithful people I've ever come into contact with have felt lonely in their life. Now my friends, Jesus does not steer us away from the storms. They are part of the human condition. And therefore they're part of the Christian condition. See, the human condition is filled with issues. And if we're going to be human, we can be Christian. We can be Christian. And I, I said this at the first service. It didn't go very well. Only humans are part of the human condition. Okay? Don't matter how much I love my grand dog, Rico. He's a dog, forward or backwards, no matter how you spell it. He's a dog. He doesn't have the kind of problems we have. We are part of the human condition. We have problems. You're right, Pastor Keith, I should check that one off. The memorialized today that we blessed, that blessed us in our lives, those who, who made us come out on a rainy day because of our care for them, I know some of these people. Their lives were not without blemish. They, they were not without life difficulty. See, the heart of Christianity... Christian theology is that storms come. But when storms come, they reveal in whom we depend, upon whom we depend. That, that's where we put our trust. We find out in our storms where our trust is. I love this old hymn. Hymn Hymnody makes a plea to us. There's an old hymn, number 512 in your hymnal, if you ever want to read it. It's called Stand By Me. And the first verse goes like this. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. So it doesn't ever say... When the storms of life are raging, make them placid, make them go away. I trust in you, Jesus. Make them flee from me. It doesn't say that. It says, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea. Which is to say, it's a matter of fact you're going to get bumped around a little bit. It's a matter of fact that things are not going to be perfect all the time. But, thou who rulest wind and water... Stand by me. See, that brings us to the second reality. Jesus never, ever denies the reality of storms. He doesn't. He knows the human condition. Pastor Keith and I have stood in this place and others and said the same thing several times. Now, you don't have to write it down, but do remember it. I think part of the human condition, there's probably only three 
phases we find ourselves in. On the way into a storm, in a storm, or just out of a storm. On the way into a storm, in a storm, on our way out of the storm. I mean, you can do everything right. I mean, this is the thing that really torques us off about life. We can do everything right, every single thing right. We can com- be completely obedient to God. We can be completely loving to our families. We can take all the health stuff, products, and eat right and all that, and we can still find ourselves in the middle of the storm. We do everything right. And still, because the world outside and around us find ourselves in a storm. And I want to encourage you and I want to remind you about this. Jesus does not deny the reality of storms in your life. He does not re- deny the reality of storms that come to all. He never says to you, he never says to me, hey, it's really not that bad. You have friends that do that though, don't you? Oh, I've been through that, it's not that bad. I just kind of want to sometimes say, stop being my friend, you know. Stop helping me by telling me my problem's not a problem, because I'm telling you it's a problem. I've spent days on this. It's a problem, okay? And Jesus never comes to us and says, your storm is not a storm. Your problem is not a problem. Your thing is no big deal. He never indicates that your storm or my storm is small. He does allow you to work in it like he let the disciples. He let them row four miles against some heavy winds, against some heavy waves. He let them row real hard. And he was proud of them while they were doing it. And he does come alongside them, though. And then show him that he's bigger than their storms. That's what Jesus does. He don't say you're not in a storm. He says, I'm bigger than your storm. I'm unafraid of your storm. Your storm cannot defeat me. Let me help you in yours. I love the second verse of this hymn, uh, Stand By Me. It says, in the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. I just want to ask you today. You don't have to raise hands or anything. Some of you need that right now, though, right? Some of you are in the storm, right? Right now. I mean, I'm not talking about the rain outside that ruined your golf today. I'm talking about the storm you're in right now, emotionally, physically, whatever. But, but this, the hymn says what our gospel truth is. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of health assail, that means when all that's against you is coming at you hard. And my strength begins to fail. Thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. See? The truth of the matter is, thirdly, and where I want to take this to today, is Jesus is the master of every storm. Jesus is the master of every storm, no matter what. He is undefeated. He is unconquerable. There is none like him. There is not a foe that has been made that even has a hand, can put a hand on the Lord Jesus. He's undefeated. And, and understand this. See, on the Galilee... You know, the boys, they're, the disciples, they're rowing hard against the water. The winds, they're battering them. They're pushing hard. Jesus is just walking. See, with or without them, he's fine. See, remember that. With or without us, God is fine. With or without the disciples, Jesus was fine. He didn't need their help. They needed his. And he was present for them. It's they who need Jesus to help their real storm. You know, I said it earlier. Christ is present no matter what. If you think about that for just a second, other than oxygen, there's nothing that's ever present no matter what. I mean, my family's not always present with me. My friends are not always present with me. Good feelings aren't always present with me. But no matter what, Christ says, I'm right here beside you. I'm already standing by you. You just need to stand by me. I'm undefeated. I'll take it on. And and so the disciples need Jesus' help. And I love this. There's this line David writes in Psalm 46, the first verse. I've quoted this to many people in troubles. And if if you're one of them, it's because I made them. In Psalm 46, 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength. An ever-present help in times and trouble. God is our refuge and strength. I, I I love the old version where it said, a very present help. In times of trouble. It, it is, of course, always and ever present. But, but it's, it's, it's like when, when, when I say that old version, which I think is probably the revised standard, it's, it's Jesus is not just there to help. He's really there to help. You know what I'm saying? It's not just like you say, call me if you need me. He says, no, I'm coming. Invite me in. Jesus, our God, is an ever-present help in all of our times of trouble. You see, 
our God. So get this part of Christian theology right. Because I tell you what, these, they believed in this and they know it. Our God is not detached. He is not far off from our problems. He doesn't watch us from the grandstand. He's not up in the cheap seats looking down, hoping for the best in our lives. He's not outside the arena of our lives. No, that's what the scripture proclaims. When, when you look in Romans, the scripture proclaims this very simple truth. When we, speaking of humankind, were utterly helpless, when we were utterly helpless, When when everything seemed too much for us, when the world seemed to be defeating us, at that moment in time, at just the right moment in time, Christ came for us. At just the right moment. You know, John Wesley is one of the leaders of, of the Methodist movement way back. You know, it's like back in the 1700s. He was on the first journey from England to Georgia. In, in the U.S., in the colonies. And just like the disciples, he got out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and there was this huge storm. The, wa- the boat he was on was getting kicked all over the place. And the English people, the people from England, were freaking out. Even though they were leaving England for religious freedom, they weren't really paying attention to, what, to, to the Lord at that time. They were freaking out, running around, getting lifeboats ready, all this kind of stuff. This, they were seven days from Georgia. So it wasn't like they were going to just you know, slide into Georgia real easy. The crew was freaking out too, running all over this boat. It must have been a pretty sizable boat because there was a lot of people on it. But there were these German Moravians. That's, that's, that's the first Protestant denomination, Moravians. These German Moravians were on the boat. And as Wesley recounted it later, he said, the Moravians never stopped. They were preaching and praying and singing when we began the cruise, in the middle of the cruise, And through this storm, without intermission, they kept praising God, expecting him to act. And Wesley changed that day. You know, because before that, he had seen in his mind's eye Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. He'd seen him. He he, he knew that to probably be true, but you see, he'd never invited him into his boat. And what the Moravians were doing there, was inviting Christ into the boat, saying, Jesus, we know you're standing right by us. Get on in the boat. Get on in the boat with us. Because when the disciples invited Jesus into the boat, bang, it was at the side of the lake. And their problems were over. You see, our God, our Jesus, has cast his lot with us. We don't need to face the storms that we face in life alone. He's the master of every storm. He is present in ever-present help in every time of trouble. He's ready to get in the boat with you. The boat and the ship of your life, no matter how it's being tossed upon the sea. And I simply admonish you, and this is it for today. Invite him in. That's it. Just invite him in. The third verse of this hymn goes like this. In the midst of faults and failures. That's us, right? In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I do the best I can, and my friends misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. i got to tell you this because it's true. We're not all going to figure out why all these storms come to us in life. We're never going to figure out why. We're not going to figure out their source. We're not going to figure what they're all about. We just won't. We've all been reaching for some of those things for a long time. But do know this. And this is what I've seen in the people that I've known that loved Christ, both represented by these candles and elsewhere. That when the storms of life come, you can tell upon whom and what they're depending upon. When the storms of life come to you and me, they reveal who we depend on. And are we going to depend on ourselves, our own mind, our own money, our own guile, our own intellect, our own abilities to make strategic moves? Or are we going to believe in a Lord who will and is able to act upon our half, on our behalf and is willing to? I say, cast your lot with him. He's already thrown his with you. Invite him in. Invite him to stand by you. And he will, says scriptures, and many of my friends that have gone beyond, he will bring you safely home. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord our God, we give you thanks for this and every other time. And whether we are that one that is heading toward a storm, whether we're that one that's in the midst of a storm, 
or whether we're one that's just on the backside of a storm. We expect you. We expect great things to happen because we know you and you know us and love us. So, Lord, for those of us that need cradling in your arms, cradle us. For those of us who need tugging away from a storm, tug us. For those of us who simply need to put our hand in yours and walk, grasp our hand. We reach for you now. Lord, this we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Take a look at this. Mary and First United Methodist Church is special to me because I, mean, I grew up in the church. And um, I, the, the youth ministry 412, I'm very involved with that. And uh, I, I mean, I go every single week, and without it, it my week would not be the same. It's uh, changed my whole perspective on life, and just love spending that time with all the people there, and I get so much out of it. I choose to give my gifts to Mary Methodist because I'm um, through youth group and through youth leadership, the group that we have, um, I've been challenged to give my portion to God and give to the church, and um, I, I've learned that I don't have to wait to give, I can give now. And my name is Dylan Fawcett, and these are the reasons why I give to Mary Methodist. Will you please join me now in worshiping God this way? Will the ushers please come forward?